Hello, my name is Katerina Bello and I teach at the American University in Cairo. Uh, and I'm going to talk about predestination in Islam. Predestination is a central topic in Islamic theology. It is expressed as qadar in Arabic, a word which relates to measure, qadar. And as a theological concept, it denotes the notions of predestination, fate and destiny. It pertains to God's power to determine his creation. Uh, the term applies to God's determination of present and future events. Um, and it's also related to God's omnipotence and so God's power. And this is one of God's attributes. And for some theologians, it is his most important attribute. This power implies the creation of the world and the subsequent creation of things and events. God created the world and keeps creating new events and things. Uh, this involves not just nat natural events and substances, but also human action. Any change and not just any human creation would be produced by God. Medieval philosophers and theologians debate the question surrounding God's nature and attributes. I'll share some slides. And so now I need to discuss what theologians and, uh, um, and philosophers say about, uh, you know, the, the framework in which this topic is debated. So they debate the question surrounding God's nature and attributes. And while theologians base their views primarily on their reading of the Quran and the Sunnah, hadiths, hadith literature, philosophers draw heavily on concepts and arguments made by ancient Greek philosophers. Um, in this sense, God is created in the Quran, and for philosophers, he's also agent and cause. Theologians and philosophers debate what the terms agent and cause mean when applied to God. God's power is one of his most uh, significant attributes alongside, for instance, goodness and knowledge. And different theologians and philosophers have different, a different understanding of these attributes. In addition to a diversity of views on God's attributes and his power to determine events, theologians and philosophers have also had to grapple with the significant consequence of setting God's power to determine events, namely human freedom. If God determines events, then human beings are not the causes or agents of their actions. In that case, they're also not responsible for their actions and cannot be blamed for them. Consequently, uh, they should not be rewarded or punished for their deeds. However, this clashes with the Quranic view that God rewards the good and punishes the wicked in this life and in the afterlife. God's determination of events and predestination could shake the very foundation of ethics and the notion that there is a difference between good and evil moral actions in that human beings determine their own actions and are responsible for them and thus should be held accountable for those actions. One could view this problem in terms of the definition of human nature and of human beings as essentially free and thus moral beings. However, some scholars argue that this is a question, essentially a, a question of God's attributes and articulating the different attributes. It is important to stress God's power in omnipotence However, if human beings are not free or not responsible for their actions, they cannot be held accountable or rewarded and punished. Reward and punishment of human beings is an essential consequence of God's justice, another important divine attribute. Therefore, this is pertaining to God's determination of events can be seen to cause problems already at the level of the articulation between different divine attributes. Um, now I move on to the question how this is debated in Quran and Hadith. Um, on the one hand, 
um, Quran talks about God's omnipotence, but also about human responsibility. So Qadar uh, appears in the Quran as meaning the divine decree in fixing, uh, quote, the limits of each thing or the measure of its, of its being, unquote. And more generally, Qadar means, um, quote, measure, evaluation, fixed limit, unquote. This is from the Encyclopedia of Islam. Um, other forms of, of this root, so the Qaf, Dal, and Ra, appear in the Quran. For instance, Miqdar, which means measure. And Qadir is a defined name which is applied to God, means powerful or omnipotent. The term Muqtadir also means omnipotent. It's also applied to God. Um, in the term Qadar, appears often in conjunction with the related term Qadar. And so we have the expression Al-Qadar wal Qadar, so which refers to God's Qadar or Qadar. Um, and the expression could be uh, translated as divine decree and predestination. And uh, again, from the Encyclopedia of Islam in the article on Qadar by Kalbi Nagi, quote, on the basis of the Quran, the word Qadar can be understood as God's eternal decision or decree concerning all things. It is given different interpretations, especially when contrasted with another term, Qadar. For instance, according to Al-Bukhari, Qadar is the eternal, universal, and all-embracing decree of God, while Qadar uh, denotes the details of his eternal, universal decree. End of quotation. And we have some chronic surahs, uh, uh, which explicitly mentioned the term Qadar, quote, verily all things have we created in proportion and measure, the Qadar, end of quotation, so that's um, 54, um, <clears throat> 49, Surah 54, verse 49, and, and this is from the meaning of the Holy Quran, translated by Yusuf Ali, um, <clears throat> and uh, we can translate this verse literally as we have created everything through Qadar. There are also verses stressing human responsibility with the assumption that human beings can freely choose their actions. Without this freedom, God would not be just. But the Quran also stresses God's justice in rewarding good deeds and uh, punishing any evil doings. Quote, then on that day, the day of judgment, not a soul will be wronged in the least nor will you be recompensed except for what you have done. End of quotation. Um, that's for uh, 36 verse 54. And in this verse, God is seen as just, but also merciful. And these verses seem to point to the power of human action in the sense that human beings choose their actions and are judged accordingly. Some of these, um, uh, some of the terms related to other are uh, um, <clears throat> the creation of faith in human beings, which is brought about by God, as well as physical sustenance. So God would determine whether someone has faith or not. The other aspect of creation of faith is the doing um, or sealing of the heart to faith. So again, in connection with faith. Um, another theme mentioned by Montgomery Watt, who studied these issues is is the, the term which means God's determination of the time of a person's death as stated in the Quran quote he it is who created you of clay and then decreed a stated term unquote that's <clears throat> um, um, Surah 6 verse 2 uh, <clears throat> the term of Qadr also appears in Hadith literature which contains the deeds and sayings of Prophet Muhammad. Um, and in Hadith, we find the notion that events are predetermined before they happen. They are written down beforehand. Uh, and uh, Montgomery Watt refers to this theme as the, the pen. Um, and there, uh, there's a, uh, a hadith which conveys uh, the theme of predestination and how human beings are predestination from the time of conception. <clears throat> and here's a quoting again from <clears throat> Montgomery Watt. The prophet said, 
Fairly, one of you has gathered together in his mother's womb 40 days. Then he's a clot of blood at the same time. Then an angel is sent to him and four things are ordained, his sustenance, his term, whether he's, he is to be miserable or happy, end of quotation. <clears throat> and within the Hadith uh, tradition, there's an emphasis on, on Qadr from uh, 700 AD or common era uh, in an agreement that God controls the destinies of human beings. We have seen that some chronic verses emphasize divine omnipotence and predestination, while others emphasize human responsibility when acting. Also in pre-Islamic literature, written before the rise of Islam in the Arabian Peninsula, the theme of destiny is an important one. In pre-Islamic poetry, <coughs> we find an important theme, which is a time, a dahr, which can also mean destiny, and constitutes an impersonal force that must be reckoned with. Uh, and so we find fatalism in pre-Islamic uh, poetry, although this is not attributed to the gods. It's like an impersonal element. And then we go to um, uh, move to Islamic theology in general. So we can distinguish their two uh, important aspects. We have the articles of faith and so a theoretical aspect, and then the principles of action. And the principles of action in Islam are embodied in the five pillars of Islam, which are the creed, shahada, uh, fasting, partic particularly during Ramadan, almsgiving, zakat, a pilgrimage to Mecca, hajj, and prayer, salat, so five times a day. In addition to these practical principles, we have the principles of faith. Um, and according to most uh, Muslim theologians, Qadar is an article of faith. Uh, and so um, the articles of, of faith, im, which is Iman in Arabic, are the belief in God and his attributes, the belief in the prophets, belief in the angels, in the sacred uh, books, and in the day of judgment. And so these are the five pr principles of, of faith. And they are followed by the belief in Qadar, the notion that everything that happens is divinely ordained. We've seen that the notion of predestination is clearly present in the Quran and in Hadith literature. It constitutes an article of faith within Islam, so a, a sixth article of faith. Um, and then now I'll move more specifically to the schools of thought. <clears throat> and, uh, and so Islamic theology, Ilm al kalam is um, an Islamic discipline that grew out, grew out of the study of the Quran in the Sunnah. The influence of philosophical sources is not to be excluded, but uh, these themes <clears throat> are related to theological issues. So unlike Christian theology, Islamic theology, Islam, is not dogmatic. In other words, there is no central authority to define which position is to be adopted, with the exception of the early ninth century <clears throat> when one caliph imposed the views of a particular school, the, the Mu'tazila, as we'll see, our Mu'tazilites, on all theologians. And so with regard to, to Qadr, one particular early theological movement was named after the term Qadr. They were named the uh, term the Qadariya, or uh, Qadarites. <clears throat> um, in this case, it seems that Qadr referred uh, not to God, but to the power of human action in the ability of human beings to act in the freedom of actions action. <clears throat> Qadar refers to the power of human beings. It's not clear if this, uh, this was a, a, a particular united religious or political group. <clears throat> According to the views of the Qadariya, all that is good comes from God and any evil is perpetrated by human beings. Uh, so God can do no evil. Moreover, power belongs to human beings as well as to God. <clears throat> and God delegates his power in human beings. Belief in God is also a free act um, enacted by human beings. And so the Qadarites comprise several groups. One of them uh, denied God's foreknowledge of human actions. And any evil act, such as, for instance, adultery, is not created by God, but by human beings, according to the Qadarites. <clears throat> 
And there, there were also political imp implications to this view. Even the caliphs were to be held accountable for their actions. In addition, this theological group opposed the Umayyad dynasty in the principle that the caliph was God's deputy on earth. And we have a prominent figure uh, in connection with the Qadarites. Uh, this was uh, Hassan al-Basri, who died in 728 of the Common Era. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> he's associated with the Qadarites because of the similar similarity of his position to that of the Qadarites. Like them, he believed in human agency. And according to him, God has knowledge of future events, but does not determine them. However, he believed that some events in human life were determined. And Qadarite views on human action were taken up by the Mu'tazila or the Mu'tazilites, a rational school of Islamic theology that was founded in the uh, eighth century of the common era and became dominant in the early ninth century. It became particularly influential during the caliphate of al Ma'mun. Uh, there was some overlap between the Qadarites and the Mu'tazila, but they were distinct theological schools. Um, <clears throat> uh, the Qadarites uh, defended the idea of human action in, in free will, and the uh, Mu'tazilites had a set of principles which also included human freedom and power to act. And so they were known as the champions of God's justice and oneness, Ahl al-Qadl wa Tawheed, since uh, these were two of the main principles which they espoused. The question of justice meant that God could not punish human beings um, in a just way unless human beings had a responsibility over their actions, which implied the power and freedom to act. Therefore, in order to safeguard God's justice, they held that human beings were free and were therefore responsible for their actions. In addition, God was not responsible for any evil and he could not command the good. Other doctrines include the view that because God was one, he was identical with his attributes. They could not be separate entities from him since that would create multiplicity in God's essence. An upshot of the theory of God's simplicity was that the Quran was not the eternal word of God, according to the Tazalites, since only God was eternal, but the Quran had the status of a created being. <clears throat> Uh, one of the important debates within the concept of predestination and again in connection with the attributes of God <coughs> is the question of whether God <coughs> creates everything. According to the Mutasalites, human beings create their own acts and are therefore responsible for them. <coughs> and um, not all schools defended the, the notion of human free will. The Shabarites, also an early school of theology, uh, they were named after the um, term Jabr, which means compulsion in Arabic. They defended <clears throat> the idea that human actions were compelled. And so there was opposition to Mutazilite views, in particular the theory of the created Quran. Uh, one such opponent was Ahmed ibn Hanbal, who was the founder of the Hanbalite school of Islamic jurisprudence. And he died in 855 um, of the common era. He fav favored a more literal reading of the Quran than the Mutazilites. He viewed the Quran as the eternal word of God. One of his admirers was Al-Ashari, who died in 935 of the Common Era. Al-Ashari had studied the Mutazilite theories and he had a, a Mutazilite teacher, um, but then he opposed later the, the uh, Mutazilite school of theology on many issues, including the studies of the Quran in the nature of God and his attributes. Um, Al-Ashri held that the divine attributes mentioned in the Quran should be taken literally as real separate entities, and he accused uh, the Mu'tazila of denying God's attributes. With regard to the status of God as creator, he said that God creates everything, including human actions. God creates each act, and uh, uh, this was called occasionalism, this idea that God creates everything directly is called occasionalism. Um, and also this view um, is based on a, a specific reading of a Quranic verse, which states, quote, it is God who created you in what you do, in a quotation, and that's 
sort of 37 verse um, um, 96. And, uh, <clears throat> and so according to the context of this passage, Abraham des destroys the idols of the Hebrews, uh, stating that God created them in what they did or were doing. According to the Mutasala, what you do, quote, what you do, refers specifically, unquote, uh, to the idols. It means that God created the idols and therefore these idols are creatures and not gods or something divine. Thus, the, the idols have no life and no power. But Al-Ashari uh, interprets the verses as, as, as stating that God creates all human actions, including voluntary actions. In the case of voluntary actions, there is a distinction made by Al-Ashari in the sense that the action um, that is created by God is acquired by human beings. Thus, God is all powerful and he creates every substance and event, but human beings become responsible in the way that they appropriate their voluntary actions and make them their own. Then Al Ghazali was an Ashraite theologian, he died in um, um, 1111, holds that God is the sole creator, um, while human, uh, human beings acquire the actions they perform. Uh, only God has true power. Uh, there are no secondary causes, although some scholars de debate um, this reading of um, Al Ghazali's position. So some say that in some writings he defends secondary causality. God creates everything directly without delegating power. We also have um, Fakhr ibn Razi, he died in 1210. Um, he was an Asherite. Um, and he was uh, influenced by uh, Avicenna. And according to him, action comes from humans, but the motive comes from God. And in this way, human acts are determined by God. And then a later theologian, even Pioneer, uh, who died in uh, 1328, also reject, rejected the views of the uh, Qadariya and the Mutazila on human action and free will because they would undermine God's um, omnipotence. <clears throat> and now we move to the uh, um, philosophers who are also influenced by theological discussions. Um, among the philosophers who base their uh, philosophical systems on Aristotelian and Platonic or Neoplatonic theories, um, they're also writing specifically on the subject of Qadr. Uh, and for the, for the philosophers, Aristotle was known as the first teacher um, and the founder of the main philosophical disciplines. And Aristotle's own position on the question of the determinism is not without ambiguity. So in principle, the philosophers have the freedom to present their own views. And so we have Al-Kindi, who died around 866, uh, defends the notion of Qadr in connection uh, with God's wisdom in ordering creation and the harmony of created events. The idea of providence underpins the defense of the principle of predestination. Uh, human beings still have freedom. Uh, therefore, it seems to um, defend all the idea on the one hand that God uh, is in charge of creation and determines everything, but human beings are also free to act. So an articulation between human freedom and God's omnipotence. Um, uh, and God acts and chooses based on his will, but he cannot do evil because he's perfectly good. Also, Al-Farabi died in 950. Um, according to him, um, in, in perhaps he's among the philosophers, the one who's more um, inclined to defend the notion of uh, human freedom. He may have been influenced by the Mutazilites. Um, according to him, there is possibility within existing things. Um, voluntary acts uh, include possibility rather than necessity. Uh, in commenting on Aristotle, uh, he states that uh, there's no definite truth of, uh, of falsity, uh, no definite truth of falsity is to be assigned um, to propositions referring to future events. So when we're talking about future events, we don't know what, yet whether they're true or false. If that were the case, then the future would be determined. Um, and so uh, there's also contingency 
in the sublunary well below the moon. <clears throat> and also, according to Al-Farabi, God's foreknowledge does not prevent possibility of contingency. Uh, then Ibn Sina, Avicenna, died in 1037, wrote three treatises on Qadr. Um, and he quotes from the Quran and Hadith to uh, substantiate his views. Um, <clears throat> and, so, and he does not lose sight of previous debates between uh, the Mutazilites and the Asherites. But he also frames the question in a philosophical way by accepting different types of causes. In particular, he's known to refer to God as the cause of causes, or literally the cause of causes, Musabib al Asbab. And within his system, God created first one effect, the celestial intellect, and the other effects issue from the first effect caused by God until the celestial world is complete, upon which the, uh, the world below the moon, the terrestrial world, ensues. And um, he adopts uh, this theory of emanation, which starts from God. Um, he adopts it from Al-Farabi. In other words, he believes that things have powers and the ability to produce their own effects. He accepts the existence of secondary causes, that is to say causes, um, in addition to God as cause of the universe. So not, it's not just God who has power, but other things have power. Even natural um, things have the power to produce some effects. So God is the cause of every effect, but not directly. <clears throat> and this principle applies also to human acts because God determines those actions through a series of secondary causes. And so things have powers, but those powers ultimately go back to God. And for this reason, I've argued that Avicenna is the determinist. Um, and also this ties up with uh, his views on Qadr, uh, tie up with this uh, conception of modal metaphysics. According to Avicenna, whatever comes into existence does so through a cause and in a necessary way. Therefore, whatever exists, exists necessarily through its cause. The causes determine the effect and the nature of the effect. Whatever, whatever happens could not have been otherwise. The implication is that um, human thoughts and volitions and, and choices are determined. Avicenna does not treat the question of human freedom or human responsibility, which again points to a, a deterministic position. <clears throat> and then um, uh, Averis Ibn Rushd, who died in 1198, wrote on many subjects. He's known as a dedicated commentator on Aristotle's works. He also wrote on medicine, jurisprudence, and theology. And among his theological writings is the Kashf uh, al-Manahij al-Adila fi aqa'id al which can be translated as uncovering the methods of the proofs concerning the doctrines of the faith. In it, we find there's a question on Qadr, Mas'alat al Qadr wal Qadr. In Fihim, human action and free will has to be articulated with Qadr, God's omnipotence. Um, in particular, he analyzes the Ashraite theory of human acquisition of actions that were created by God, and the question whether someone can be free in acquiring actions that were created by God. He begins by analyzing. Quranic verses on this issue, then the positions of the various theological schools, and finally, he adduces arguments from reason. He stresses that God is not only the first creator, but also the only agent, fa'il. However, free will is required for actions to be attributed to the human subject. In other words, human beings can only be made responsible for their actions if they're not coerced, but free to perform them. In his view, which is in line with this position on secondary causality, the doctrine that human beings and natural beings also have powers that were given to them by God, God creates in us the power to act and to choose. The causes of human action are made available by God and he removes any obstacle to those actions. The actions are attributed to us. The external causes lead to our actions in combination with our will. Averis explains the mechanism for action as forming an idea of something we aim at. The ascent to that idea in the ascent tasdiq is not due to our choice. This view is also propounded with regard to faith in, in the decisive treatise, the famous short work that he wrote. 
our acts then are dependent on external causes. Uh, our acts result from external causes and internal causes. And in the sense that the, the external causes appear to determine the internal causes, a deterministic position can be discerned. Um, there appears to be a strong defense of the idea of God's omnipotence in, a, in a various writings, including his commentaries on Aristotle's works. Uh, now I've mentioned mainly Sunni schools um, of theology and philosophers. Uh, the Shia schools um, have different views on these issues, which I'll uh, um, uh, discuss in, 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 in more detail in the future. And in now just a, a comparison, brief comparison with Jewish and Christian views. And um, for instance, Maimonides, who is a medieval Jewish scholar and philosopher, um, some scholars say that he was a libertarian, and so he defended the notion of free will. But others say that if you read some of his writings carefully, it's, it emphasizes God's um, omnipotence and determination of events. And then uh, Aquinas, who was a Christian um, um, theologian of the medieval period, um, if you look at his main in, in uh, at the Summa Theologica, which is um, Aquinas' final work in Magnum Opus. In question 23, he addresses the issue of predestination um, and states that human beings are predestined. Uh, in predestination here has a very specific meaning. It means that um, it is determined in advance whether human beings will be saved or not. And so if they're going to heaven or not. I have another question in the same work on human free will, question 83 of the first part of the Summa. He states that human beings have free will. And then also in the first part of the Summa, question 116, which is about fate. Aquinas affirms the existence of fate and states that it is in created things and that it, fate cannot be changed. Um, and so to conclude, uh, with regard to Islamic, uh, the Islamic concept of predestination, the Quran contains first supporting divine determination of events and also human responsibility. And early schools of theology defended the idea of human freedom, like the Qadarites and the Mutazilites. Uh, others emphasized God's determination of events, such as the Jabrites. The Asherites wished to emphasize God's omnipotence without undermining um, his justice. Therefore, they come up with the notion of acquisi acquisition, cusp or iktisab, whereby human beings appropriate actions created by God and thus become responsible for them. Um, and so there was some, in medieval Islam, there were some tendencies towards favoring human free will and action, but later theological schools in Sunnism defend the notion of God's uh, omnipotence such that God is the only agent. This view seems to have influenced some philosophers, particularly uh, Avicenna and the various who uh, defend deterministic views about human action. Um, <clears throat> and this is, uh, uh, and they develop this kind of determinism informed by uh, Aristotelian views on causation. Thank you very much.